Wowee. President LeBlanc, the trustees, faculty, staff, proud parents, grandparents, nuclear families, blended families, families of choice, siblings, I want to cover everybody, and especially you, the new SNHU graduates. I am honored and really grateful to be here with you. Congratulations. This is your day. It's a day to celebrate the triumphant, bold, decisive step into your future, and really the future of the whole world. There will be more occasions to celebrate. Some really amazing and some really hard things will happen. And fear and doubt will be a part of your life. The beautiful thing? is that you get to decide how much mental real estate they occupy. And you can summon your inner resolve to move forward. If you remember anything of what I am saying today, let it be this. You will be given innumerable choices and opportunities throughout your life to drive or to be driven. Get ready, prepare to put both hands on the wheel. Now let me tell you a little bit about what is not on that fancy list of achievements that you just heard. Like many of you, I am a first-generation college graduate, the ninth of 11 children in an Irish Catholic, if you had not guessed, family. There was an abundance of love and plenty of friends drawn around our eccentric household but money was in short supply, and college education was not a tradition. In fact, I watched as one sibling after another either didn't apply or dropped out of college. They couldn't keep up financially or academically or got swept up in drugs and alcohol. I am so proud to say that two sisters who married when they were young did go and get their degrees in their 40s. I was determined to be different. I was going to be a writer and travel the world and be daring and free and have adventures that I could write about. I studied here in New Hampshire and then abroad, taking out loans, waiting on tables, working in pubs, even scrubbing down bathrooms to pay my tuition and survive. I was swimming in the full stream of life, but I did not do a lot of writing. I now realize that for most of my 20s, I was careening back and forth between extreme bravado and crushing self-doubt, never really knowing which one was in charge. I was being driven by a yearning to be interesting and accomplished and fabulous. But I was drifting, not steering, and had no inner compass pointing the way. I came back to the States at 25 and discovered my true north in the decadent, downcast city of New Orleans. I volunteered and then was eventually hired at New Orleans community radio station I worked a million hours a week for almost nothing. And during that time, met people who truly challenged me to question my core assumptions and my relative privilege as a young, educated white woman from the Northeast. That is how and where I discovered what it means to listen, to truly listen to another person. I learned that genuinely hearing their stories and their vision of the world creates compassion. You can disagree with someone's opinion, but you cannot disagree with their experience. And after so many years being driven to distinguish myself as a writer, I listened to my inner voice and admitted that I lacked the talent or the discipline to toil away alone. I recognize that I work best as a collaborator and am more captivated by the emotions and passions and vulnerabilities revealed in the human voice 
than in a novel. And that is what blossomed into a career that led me to producing and reporting other people's stories, and later traveling all around the world to some of the most traumatized and impoverished places. I met a young man called Ishmael in one of these places on an assignment to train journalists. It was four years after the end of a brutal civil war that shattered the West African nation of Sierra Leone. Ishmael was just nine when the rebel army swept in and wiped out his village and his family. He was snatched up as a child soldier. I listened as he slowly unraveled his story of regular beatings, hunger, and being forced to commit unspeakable violence for four terrifying years. Like many other child soldiers, after the peace was struck, his villagers were wary of having him back. He was unskilled and he was uneducated. Ishmael taught himself woodworking and eventually set up a school for carpentry and teaching other outcasts to read and to write. I was stunned, a man that had experienced such cruelty, and asked him how he found the will to help others. It is not what happens to you, Virginia, he told me in his West African accent. It is what you do with it. You take the next step, and you never, never give up. I share this message with you today, not to tell you how good you have it, but because it stayed with me and it changed me. No matter how acute the hurts and losses I feel I've suffered or the frequent mortifications at doing a less than perfect job, I, we, can choose to be driven by a wish that things have gone differently or we can choose to pick ourselves up and move on. So how do we decide what that next step is? Adrian Ramos, who sits among you today as a new SNHU graduate and presidential ambassador told me, patience is key, not only for others, but ourselves. After his very first visit to SNHU, Adrian had to face his truth, that he couldn't really afford the program. He accepted help from SNHU's diversity office and the Jumpstart program. His mother took multiple jobs to help, and he worked his way through as an RA. What comes next is not what we do with the rest of our lives, but rather the next challenge to face, Adrian told me. We must be simultaneously impatient in chasing our goals, but also patient in allowing for the process of making progress. For Adrian, that process involved cultivating community. He built homes for veterans. He took a leadership role in student government and started a bodybuilding and fitness club. Off campus, he got involved with a commission to create safer, more accessible housing and environments for local youth. This is something desperately needed in a state currently gripped by opioid addiction. So bravo, Adrian. I would not want to arm wrestle you. <laughs> I really wouldn't want to arm wrestle you, but I can't wait to see where you land. Now, Adrian's story reminds us that driving and racing are different things. Looking over your shoulder to see who's pulling ahead is a fast track to what I call the comparatorium. It's a dark place where everyone else's life appears shiny and accomplished and yours feels hopeless, and where we replay every regret or lost opportunity or embarrassing mistake in meticulous detail. We are all susceptible to dwelling in this melancholy from time to time, especially when we find news of fancy jobs and engagements and exotic vacations and pictures of kids who never whine or have cavities posted by our peers on social media. Research at the University of Tel Aviv found that people who spend more time on social media feel more isolated than those who do not. 
The constant feeling of social comparison leads people to judge themselves more harshly and to feel worse. So what does make people feel better? Genuine, old-school engagement. Taking part in communal events like today's celebration. Helping others. And by figuring out who you are. Now, we're all loaded down with messages of what success looks like. Your challenge is to find an inner refuge from that legacy of expectations. That gap between how things look on the outside and feel on the inside. Maybe when you get passed over for a job or your student loan bill comes due. Or I'm talking to you, Jackie Capabianco, and all of your fellow educators. When the parent of a student can't understand why you don't recognize their child's exceptional genius. You have to locate that inviolable place, that well to draw from, when things happen to you, just as Ishmael and Adrian did. If you don't want to live life as a passenger, I urge you to forge a deep connection to that authentic sanctuary of self and make regular visits. You can call it faith or friendship, your better angels, your higher self, your best self, whatever feels reliable to you. If you do decide to call it your happy place, I would recommend not doing so in public. And that connection doesn't come from wishing. It's a muscle. You can work that muscle every day in small ways. Sometimes all it takes is to pause. Pause and ask yourself, what's the next right thing? And who knows, sometimes it's just doing the laundry. Your life is transforming at an extraordinary time, a time of wildly divergent visions of progress and inclusiveness and security across our nation and the world. We have no idea what is to come in this always dynamic world. Here is what is certain. You've completed a monumental step by getting a degree. Now it is time to build on that momentum as you transition from the relative safety of an academic institution into a market where you may not get your dream job right away. I didn't. I thought I'd be in Vanity Fair, and I'm in New Hampshire. <laughs> With my family, listening to creative, interesting people every single day, and living a richer and fuller life than I could have imagined. And I work in radio. I can wear sweatpants. <laughs> my advice, stay close to your passion and develop a community that supports you, and you will find your way. We don't tell stories about people who dwell and complain about their bad luck or hard lives. Think of all the names that have lived on through the great epics and movements of history. Heroic tales will not be told about people who spend night after night crushing it at Halo or power-watching Netflix. We remember people who overcame their own excuses and lack of self-confidence. We've read about them. They were petrified, many of them. They felt like frauds, and they acted despite it. They drove past the obstacles in their road with grace and with grit. It is not life's challenges that define you. It's how you rise above those challenges. Just by being here today, all of you have proven that you can get over challenges. Keep going on that road and drive and dive headfirst into the raw, exhilarating, sometimes terrifying experiences of life. Be kind. People remember kindness. So will you. And don't get bogged down in worry. The next right thing will come in unexpected and amazing ways. I look at this room, look at this floor, I'm so inspired by all of you, and so hopeful. I believe deeply, when I look at this arena, that all of you will excel in your own ways, beyond your expectations, and maybe differently from your expectations, and live into your full potential. 
Congratulations to all of you, and thank you for listening. Let's hear it for the SNHU graduates.